Hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, a show serving the greater bleeding disorders community brought to you by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media and made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. I'm your patient advocate and host, Patrick James Lynch. And I'm your healthcare advocate, nonprofit nerd, other host, also Denver Nuggets fan. Yes, we know. I am victorious. Amy Bourne! <laughs> and I'm reminding you to please speak with a healthcare professional before making any decisions. All the things. Amy is victorious. I just That's the <laughs> takeaway from what you just heard. On today's show, we have our latest installment of the music and self-expression segment, this time with a spotlight on community member and bloodstream guest from the past, yes. Max Feinstein. Yes. We also have a conversation with Jessica Lauren Richmond of Flow yes. to learn about what's going on with Flow and just sort of catch up with someone we... Uh, well, you work very closely on flow. Mm -hmm. I'm a little at arm's length, but go way back with Jess. So just a good conversation coming up. And as Amy acknowledged, <laughs> life is full of precious moments that deserve celebration and understanding. <laughs> Today is one of them for Denver sports fans led by Amy. This is your year. And yes, we will talk about that and more on this episode. Welcome to Bloodstream. Thank you for joining us today. If you're a Denver Nuggets fan, extra special. Thank you for joining <laughs> us today. Remember, if you like what you hear and all the things, please subscribe to the Bloodstream podcast. We don't talk about basketball every time. Not usually. But when I win, it's always fun. So subscribe. Okay. Also, you can find us on the social media, all the things. And listeners, I do need to remind you that the Bloodstream podcast is made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Takeda. Yes, that's right. Takeda. Takeda's got this website, bleedingdisorders.com, where you can learn all about Takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Takeda <laughs> believes in a world free of bleeds. Which is great. I concur. Mm -hmm. And they're dedicated more than ever in their efforts to offer a wide range of support and resources for you on your patient journey, wherever on that journey you may be you can learn more by simply visiting bleedingdisorders.com. One more time, though, <laughs> if you need it, bleedingdisorders.com. And for their founding and ongoing support of the Bloodstream podcast, I would just like to say thanks, Takeda. Thanks, Takeda. <laughs> All right, Amy Board, it's been a little bit of time, but you're clearly still riding high. And riding as a high. hoop head, I will not get in the way of this. I know. All things Denver Nuggets, basketball, celebrations, parades, give it to me. How are you? How's your family? When's oh Jenny gosh. coming on the pod? I know. When's Jenny coming on? I should have worn my championship gear because my mom went out and called every single Dick Sporting Goods in the Denver metro area to get like the finals merch. Is she a Dick's loyalist? <laughs> That's actually a great question. I don't know. We'll ask it I don't to her. know Keep her making a note when Jenny comes on. We have a question about Dick's sporting Great, goods. great. But I got a hat. I got a t-shirt. We're hey. champions. The town went insane. I'm sure you saw the it all over. Crazy. It was insane. It looked like a presidential inauguration, <laughs> sort of just like people on people on people. It was crazy. Aaron Gordon like went out into the streets, like shirtless. Oh, I heard about this. I actually <laughs> meant to look this up, but I didn't. <laughs> he did. A man of the people. A he, real like, man of the people. <laughs> walked out of the stadium. He just walked out into the, like the throngs of people. I love it. <laughs> anyway. It Why not? Absolutely Who phenomenal. out there is not going to be thrilled by that? I know. It was just, it was so great. And then the greatest thing of all time, you know, of course, like our MVP. Yeah. Okay. We went back and forth on messages about this because yes. his, his press conference right after the game, oh, they were like, God. are you excited about the parade? It's so funny. It's like, he, oh, when is the parade? He just I like, go home. the man just wanted to go home. <laughs> the most relatable. His family is racing horses <laughs> and he just wanted to go home. So his whole vibe after the whole thing was like, we did the job. Now we get to go home. Now so then at home. the press conference, they asked him about the parade and he like had this like deer in headlights look and he's like, when's the parade? He like asked somebody to the side of him, like, when's the parade? Friday. And they tell Friday. him Friday. And he like was bummed. He's like, I have to go home. We have all, that moment was like, we've all had that like, oh, when is that thing? No. <laughs> I've never felt so seen. Like, I let the man go home. Anyway, he went to the parade, and I think he uttered quite possibly the greatest like sentence in Denver sports history. And because we are the Bloodstream Podcast, we have it for you right here. Ladies and gentlemen, from Nikola Jokic himself. You know that I, I told that uh, I don't want to stay on parade, but I bleeping want to stay on parade. This is the best. <laughs> I bleeping want to stay on parade. Oh my God. Is 
I don't know how often I can find an organic use for it, but I'm hunting. <laughs> I know. I bleeping want to stay on parade. I, my favorite thing is he like told the crowd, I know I wanted to go home. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you come out to the party before the cake. And then Listen, he goes, but this is great. I tried to get out before the cake. This is the longest birthday party. It's at 7 o'clock on the invitation. I was here at 7.15. It's 9.30. There's been no cake. I've been trying to get out of here. I know that. You know that. We all know that. However, this is a pretty good party after all. Oh it was that moment. And it I, was. He just continues to impress. So congratulations <laughs> to the Denver Nuggets, to Amy Boer, Jenny. Let your daughter know when you're coming on the show. She mm -hmm. knows the schedule. She has access to Monday.com, and we will make it happen. You're That's coming great. on to talk Denver Nuggets some more. Can't wait. Maybe a, maybe we'll do some football. We'll check in on baseball. Yeah. Let's get a sports roundup. Maybe we'll roundup. do like a sports roundup with Jenny. Yeah, we now have a Denver sports anchor oh. just because <laughs> we were lacking that in the show that we needed it. But speaking of things that have more relation to the reason we're a podcast in the first place, <laughs> I wanted to acknowledge, I got a cool, or I should say we got a cool email that I responded to mm -hmm. in our Mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. Email address. See, people email that email, you guys. And this time it came from the Robinson family. Yes! And, and here's what they wanted to tell us about. You know, Christina Robinson and her son Axel, who's two years old, are this year's walk chairs for the 2023 Unite for Bleeding Disorders Walk for the New England Hemophilia Association. The walk is the biggest fundraiser of the year for NEHA and makes up approximately 30% of the funds needed for the organization's annual programming to support the NEHA community. You can look up the Robinson family and their efforts and learn more about the cause at The Axe Factor on Instagram. And that's T H E dot A X E dot factor on instagram there'll be a link in the program notes as well they gave us uh they shot an email our way to say hey would you mind telling people about the walk the really big important uh moment of the year for the for the association so we said sure and amy i was wondering if you could also so this is happening in neha mm -hmm. but neha isn't the only place that has a walk going on this time of year what are these walks exactly and why do they matter that's actually like the million dollar question, really, truly. I, I think um, I think many people in our community have a perception that our local organizations are funded solely through pharmaceutical funds. Mm -hmm. And there's truth to that. Or by the national organization. It all Correct. just comes from them, right? Right. Or, you know, and I mean, I think uh, the hemophilia local organizations are actually better set up financially than a lot of other rare and chronic disease organizations hmm. Um, because of our connection to the pharmaceutical industry and because we have so many different therapies to choose from. However, um, those monies are really starting to streamline and they're starting to uh, decrease. And it's been um, kind of a conversation uh, probably over the last decade about, you know, what is the sustainability going to be for these local organizations mm -hmm. and what is the the purpose of these local organizations? And I think those of us here that are listeners that have um, worked in this community know that um, the local organizations for the bleeding disorder community are invaluable to this experience. 100%. And I have always told my community, I was an executive director of one of these you know, organizations for about seven years. And I always told my community that we don't anticipate or or demand that you be involved with us for the, you know, course of your life 100% of the time. Having a rare and chronic disease, you know, there, there are peaks and troughs. Sure. And sometimes you're riding high and you don't need that support. You don't need the education. You don't need the, the community, if you will. And there are times when you really do. And those times that you do, it is invaluable to have that resource, to have access to community, to have education, to have somewhere where you can um, ask questions in a trusted and safe environment. And the WALK fundraiser is one of those... Um, uh, programs, if you will, that helps keep those organizations sustainable. And it's also an opportunity. You know, walks are cool. Every rare and chronic disease does them. You know, it's it's an opportunity every single year to tell your story to your family and friends who may not know. You know, hemophilia, it, it, it has a language of its own, bleeds mm. and butterfly needles and gene therapy and, you know, all of these things that um, a lot of folks are uncomfortable with per se, and this is your yearly annual opportunity to tell your story, to tell your child's story, to tell what it's like to be a sibling, to be a grandparent, uh, to be a niece or a nephew, to be an aunt or an uncle, to be a parent, to be a guardian or caretaker. And it's just 
you know, or a patient for heaven's sakes. Um, and so anyway, I, I have such a, a heart for families that really um, connect with this program. I love that Axel, two years old, is the chair of the walk. Co-chair. That's fair. Yeah. That's, that's fair. He's, he's a co-chair. I have a feeling he's going to crush it. I have a great feeling as well. And <laughs> you can track the action at the dot axe dot factor Amazing. on Instagram. If you want to find out more about walks in your area, if you go to hemophilia.org, you can take a look on the events page to see about walks that might be coming up in your area. If you, of course, know your local patient advocacy organization, you can contact them directly to see if there is a Unite for Bleeding Disorders walk coming up in your area or another large community event that may be of interest to you. Something such as the national community event that is the Bleeding Disorders Conference from the National Hemophilia Foundation, which is also taking place this summer in August, uh, about four or eight weeks out from the time that we're recording this, uh, August 17th, 16th, 17th, that's somewhere around there is the start date, mm -hmm. just outside of Washington, D.C. It is going to be full of all sorts of educational and uh, community building events and sessions. I want to highlight in particular Redefining Impossible, the Believe Limited documentary you've heard us talk about here before. You heard the audio trailer a couple episodes ago. That film, Redefining Impossible, showcasing five elite athletes with hemophilia from around the world, will debut at the National Hemophilia Foundation's Bleeding Disorders Conference this August, just outside of Washington, D.C. For more information about the conference or to register if you have not yet, visit hemophilia.org. All right. So with that being said, again, good luck to the Robinson family and to all the walkers this summer around the country. We hope to also see many of you in August at the BDC, but we'll have plenty of time to talk to you about what's happening at BDC between now and then. For now, however, Amy Board, we are going to talk to someone we haven't talked to for this podcast, I don't know, ever? She's been on the podcast. She's had a segment on yes. the podcast. Maybe we've done short interviews. Yeah. I don't know. It's all kind of merged in my head, but we've yeah. never had a nice like sit down like this with Jessica Lauren Richmond yes. from the Flow Podcast. That's next right after this little musical thing. Jessica Lauren Richmond of the Flow Podcast, of the Mark Summers on Raps Podcast, awesome. of the Well Segment on the Bloodstream Podcast, of many things through the life cycle of Believe Limited. Mm. She's currently the guest that Amy and I have here in studio to chat with. <laughs> Jessica Lauren Richmond, welcome to Bloodstream. Thank you. This is my favorite morning show. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate that for your consideration. We do accept Emmy nominations. <gasps> Great. Um, but we brought you in here, amongst yeah. other things, to talk about flow and all things flow and what's going on in the world of flow. I imagine there's a fair amount of, I, I know there's a fair amount of listeners that listen to both shows, yeah. but not necessarily all. Amy, it's it's of benefit, at least to me personally, I hear a little more maybe about what's happening in the world of flow because Amy is a producer on that show in addition to what she does here for Bloodstream. So Amy... Maybe you have a little bit more insight as to what's happening in the world of flow right now than I do. But at the end of today, we're all going to be caught up. Hmm. Well, I guess, Jay Rich, I, I would actually love to hear this. Like, n I'm not just like throwing you a question. I guess, how has flow evolved? It, we're in year three, if I, um, I is that right? right. Like, true. It, yeah. like in, in the middle three, of yeah. year three, yeah. how has it evolved since we first began? You know, we began really foundational. You know, what is normal menstrual bleeding? Mm -hmm. What is abnormal? What is disordered menstrual bleeding? Like, how has it evolved? What has the storytelling been like? Right. Well, I guess we started really clinically trying to lay that foundation, which was good educational for me, myself, getting to talk to so many OBGYNs in year one changed the way my brain thought about menstruation for mm. sure, mm. which then led to season two and three where we've evolved with a new host. I mean, I'd say the number one thing we talk about on flow is blood. Can you relate? A yeah. little bit. A little bit. Yes. But unlike the blood that flows through your veins, we're talking about the blood that grows and sheds from your uterus. Mm -hmm. But we also are with Sarah Watson's sex therapist mm. because when you're talking about blood, you're also often talking about sex no relationships and talking about how mm -hmm. you think about your menstrual cycle mm -hmm. and so i'd say the podcast has evolved to a clinical definition of menstruation mm -hmm. to a conversation about the reality of mm -hmm. experiencing extreme menstruation and i think you know one of the things about this podcast in particular w w i know when we set out 
you know, three years ago, one of the things is we wanted to like normalize the conversation around it and also normalize the conversation around extreme bleeding. Um, those with von Willebrand's disease who have um, hemophilia, women who have hemophilia, and also other, you know, conditions, other disorders. Um, extreme bleeding is oftentimes not even addressed. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's family history there. Um, so everybody thinks it's normal. Is it normal? And then we just don't talk about it. Like relationally, we just, it is something so taboo. Mm -hmm. And so what has it been like for you to have this, you know, monthly conversation about it, to talk to other people, hear other stories? What, is, what has it been like for you to like get the conversation going? I mean, personally, it's been affirming that I'm very comfortable with like clinical things like menstrual blood. Like yeah. I personally feel very, like I don't feel that it's a taboo subject. I also wasn't brought up in a purity culture, which as we continue to explore different kinds of guests and different stories we find is an impact on how a menstruator is in touch with their own bleeding mm -hmm. and menstrual cycle bleeding depends on the upbringing they had, if it was copacetic to talk about it or not. Right. So I don't know. So that, yeah, for personally, I've been like, yeah, no, I'm into it. Like, let's talk about it. Like, let's get into it. Put it in your plant with like a manifestation every month. Like, check the smell of it to see if you have an iron deficiency. Like, those conversations should be happening anywhere where there's someone who has had a uterus or has a uterus mm -hmm. or cares about someone who has had a uterus or has a uterus, which is should be everyone. Everyone should be talking about menstrual blood. Is there anything that you've learned specific to the experience of having a bleeding disorder and how that relates to menstruation that might be interesting to spotlight as part of this conversation? I mean, the number one thing would be many menstruators don't know they have a bleeding disorder because they don't they don't know they have a bleeding disorder because they don't trust the healthcare system mm. and like accepting endurance bleeding is a mm. through line. On every episode, there's been patients. so many stories of dismissal, like mm. just very like passive dismissal, um, even kind dismissal, mm. you know, just like, you know, telling folks that they don't have an issue or something and then finding out years later that they do. Um, it seems to be like a, a theme. Yeah. Yeah. On the bleeding disorders um, part of it all, you had a recent episode with Dr. Uh, Jessica Foley, I believe, mm -hmm. about von Willebrand disease. And von Willebrand disease in general has been getting more attention. There's more research. There's more publication on it in the last two, three years than historically. I'm curious from that episode and from other conversations that you've had since it started, with respect specifically to von Willebrand disease, Anything notable about menstruation or, again, worth highlighting as part of today's conversation? Von Willebrand's is so complex to diagnose. That is the same as it was three years ago. That mm. has not changed. And it's so underdiagnosed, which I'd say is the same. So it's showing up. Maybe that second point is changing. Maybe more people are coming around to explore what's going on with their cycle and finding out, getting a PTT test, which is something we mm. learned from Jess Foley. Um to find out if they do have a clotting issue. But also, Jess Foley really pointed out, Dr. Jess Foley mm -hmm. pointed out the problem is that people take an issue with cycle bleeding as just a little problem. Like they might be a little anemic. Yes. But you wouldn't say you're a little diabetic and not take your insulin. Yes. You have tons of people being a little von Willebrand deficient. Yes. And not exploring any treatment solution. And that's the problem. Which also feels, not that all these things need to be related, Amy, but it kind of also, to me, rings a bell in the mild hemophilia yes. conversation, too, where it's like, well, and, and the carrier conversation even more so. It's like, well, if they are, if those humans are experiencing symptoms consistent with a factor deficiency called hemophilia, why are we calling these humans carriers or exclusively calling them carriers? Because right. it's still true that they're carrying mm -hmm. the genetic material but they have the thing. Right. Okay, this person has a mild form of the thing, but they have the thing they need treatment in order to, right. it feels related to this idea of accepting being, quote, a little bit anemic, mm -hmm. accepting, you know, oh, well, that person bleeding, they're, they're mild. Yeah, but their x-rays are gonna show you that by the time they hit 30, their joints have been bleeding in ways that are consistent with someone that has hemophilia, that right. is 
d- decades beyond where it should be from mm. a joint health standpoint. Yeah, I mean, endurance, endurance bleeding, it's not a sport anyone chooses, it's a sport that chooses you. <laughs> <laughs> and like, mm. to endure, why is that the normalcy? Right. That's Terrible. We talk about on flow, normalizing the conversation, not normalizing the acceptance of an extreme yes. experience. So how can we normalize not accepting less than qual- a higher quality of life? It's hard because if you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. It's also so bizarre and perhaps uniquely human that we are more capable of accepting the extreme, quote, endurance bleeding experiences than we are of accepting uncomfortable conversation about mm. such things. So human of us. AI would never do that. Oh, God. <laughs> you know? AI would be like, let's talk about it. Yeah, like, no, whatever. no. But, you know, if if your mother has experienced it, if your grandmother has experienced it, there was a normalization, you know, kind of like growing up that this is just how it is, which a lot of these stories tend to be. And it's just kind of like, yeah, mm. you know. Generational. There's definitely a yeah. generational thing happening. We're amidst it. Yes. Where, we're, yes. And I mean, I'm sure it's been happening for generations. Yeah. Which sounds like cyclical talk. Yeah. But it is. Like we're in the midst of reminding the older generation that we don't want to be hazed. The things that were endured before were not advantageous to right. thriving. I, so I, I have a question on that actually, and I'm I'm curious again if there's a like a gender piece in this too. Do you find that older women? can be equally or more dismissive of someone's experience of what we'll call an extreme menstrual period than older men? Is there a set, like when you just said the thing about hazing, it made me think like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the older brothers in the frat haze the younger ones. Is there, and I know it can come up in the workplace where, you know, and I, I don't mean to like either mansplain or misspeak in the company of two very intelligent women. So correct me if I'm wrong here. But there's conversation. I think there's data to support that in some workplaces, women have more difficulty when their direct report or the person who's like the gatekeeper to their making progress on the ladder is another woman. This feels related to me as a concept to the idea of, hey, when I was when I was your age, I was able to tolerate these these mildly anemic periods, these extreme periods, like why why is it a problem for your soft generation? I can hear parallels there, but again, I don't want to pretend to know things I don't or overly relate things that don't actually relate to each other, but that feels logically connected, and I'm curious if either of you have comments on that. I don't want to generalize, but I have experienced the hazing impact of what you just described. That is what it's like, so you have to endure it. Hey, younger woman, that's what it's like. So you have to endure it. This is I'm me as an older woman trying to be helpful, perhaps. Right. And say this is the survival you have to achieve right now, which at the end of the day is not untrue. Right. But there's definitely not a precedent in an older generation of knowing how necessarily, depending on the person, to reach down with like, a, I don't know how to help, but let's try. Mm. Because if they didn't have that experience from their generation above them, there's just not... I mean, a way to learn it. I've had a different experience a little bit. I think um, in some of the conversations that I've had, not only in my circle, but also in the bleeding disorders community, there's been more of a, almost a a softening of, we didn't talk about any of this when I was Mm. a kid. So there's like an acknowledgement of like, this, this is something that it went on and we didn't, we didn't talk about any of this and I don't have any... I, 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 I completely ignored, you know, what was happening or, you know, I had like one bad interaction with a doctor and so just kind of like shut down a little bit or, um, you know, I have fought and fought and fought for my own care and I want to make sure that my daughter doesn't like feel that because, mm. you know, they have had, you know, kind of um, an awakening that like, oh, this isn't, th- there's something that we can do about this because they've been connected to like a bleeding disorder community organization where they've heard other stories. You know, the second that you hear other stories of like, oh my gosh, there's a way for me to not experience this. It, this this is, isn't something I have to endure. You know, that is hmm. a very human thing that I think we all experience with chronic pain. I think with, um, with, with anything really, um, but I've had some experiences, not to say no, yeah. that there isn't there, but I have I have also had experiences of older generation, like almost marveling a little bit, like we mm-hmm. didn't talk about this. 
you know. And I would add that the older generation might have more, to generalize, mistrust of the white coats yes. of doctors because of their experience yes. versus more of the bridging that's happening now because there's also people getting into the field of medicine who want right. to be the change and see the change right. that could be. Um, Jess, what have you learned about your own health over the course of this show? Like, what are some of the mm. nuggets that you have taken away? I'm really curious about this. You're so connected to, like, your health and your body, and oh I'm interested. I mean, there's knowing and there's understanding, so mm. I've, like, known some things, but mm -hmm. it's good. Repetition helps to understand, mm. for sure. I can give you an example. It's a pop quiz. <gasps> Excited. Oh, ready to not. play. Okay. Here we go. Oh, God. <laughs> I didn't know. For <laughs> both of you. No, no preparation. Here we go. What is day one of a menstrual cycle? Like, what happens on day one? What happens on day one? Well, my guess was going to be Wednesday. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't think it's... Day one of a menstrual cycle is ovulation? No. What? Uh, not ovulation. Oh, it's... Correct. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, good. These rules were me friendly. Follow up, Go follow up, follow up. Do you know what it happens? It's not just not ovulation. It is... No, I do not. Okay, it's the first day you bleed. The first day of menstruation. And like that's important when you're tracking your cycle to know it's not the day, the first day you're not bleeding. It's the first day you're menstruating. Okay. So I'm going to go off a little bit, but Ludwig Wittgenstein was a German philosopher who said we cannot have a conversation about anything until we both agree we have the same definitions for the words we're using. Mm. Agreed. And so if I'm having a conversation with my OBGYN about how many days my cycle is, but I think day one is different than what day one is according to what oh. they've decided. It's going to be a confusing combo. So I've learned that day one of a menstrual cycle is the day you're bleeding. Count from day one when you're counting how many days your cycle is. Wow. 28 is a average norm. Interesting. There you go. Full of tips and info here on the Bloodstream Podcast. Has there been a conversation with an OBGYN that stands out to you as particularly relevatory mm. i mean yeah i like i like social media dr perkins call me dr p was on oh. season one i love what she's doing dancing information out to people um the millennial obgyn mm -hmm. was on with us runs great activism from that account we had endo black which is on instagram not an obgyn an activist so i'm going off topic but yeah no i love when obgyns are tapping into the communication portal of social media what was a conversation there. on flow that made you uncomfortable? <gasps> Good question. Bye. I know mine. It's when me and other guys had oh, to come God. on and say oh, stuff. That was great. Oh, that was one of my that favorites. That was very uncomfortable. Was my it? least favorite to listen back to. Okay. Uh, I do not want to skip over Jess's answer, but I do want to yeah. ask. Because that, that actually is a great send up or callback. If you guys haven't listen. listened mm -hmm. to the episode first season of flow we had three of our favorite dudes talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. menstruation and they were very loving what was uh, that experience link like in the for program you? notes I guess. <laughs> yes, men and menstruation. uncomfortable i mean it was it was more comfortable because it was it was friends right like right. who were hosting it and it was a friendly environment but it was very uncomfortable because it was uh, illuminating just in wonderful clair wonderful contrast like where my gaps in knowledge were mm -hmm. and um, that of course made me feel a little insecure um, but the other thing it highlighted was like how shared a lot of that is like how I'm not alone mm. um, th as, a, as a guy and probably just as a person in how many knowledge gaps there truly are about menstruation and menstrual health and, and frankly all things women health women's health so mm. um it was uncomfortable, but it felt important for the mm. reasons that I think you wanted to do it for the show in the mm -hmm. first place. And yeah, I mean, you have to lean into stuff like that. You can't just talk about the comfortable things. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable too. So not something I would have chosen to do here on Bloodstream, but <laughs> when mm. the invite comes from the flow pod, I go, oh, well, okay, I'm going to be uncomfortable, but okay. <laughs> Answer the call. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, we got off track a little bit because I, I threw a joke out there. What do there. you think? Oh. I genuinely am trying to think like I'm, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty comfortable. I want to talk more weird stuff. I yeah. don't know. Wow. We got to push, we got to push the, yeah. the limits a little bit. Was there anything you had recently an episode with uh, three extreme menstruators, so to speak, and you may have already answered this when talking about that common thread of dismissal, but was there anything in speaking with those three or, you know, others whose stories resonate similarly to theirs 
that really, really strikes you as a common thread through these discussions other than dismissal, which is huge, but anything else common thread? I mean, endurance, endurance, people saying things like, no, I just bleed and I suffer. I don't do anything to help. When I ask for tips for some people, they're like, I don't really have any solutions. It just hurts a lot. That's mm. a through line. I will also say our log line is, hey, how's your flow? It's not just a log line. We on Flow want to know how your flow is. So there is a Calendly link brought to you by Calendly <laughs> um, in the show notes to just set aside 30 minutes. We'll record for like 10 of them. We'll just chat about your period a little bit. I'm looking forward to it. If you are listener, uh, these the program notes yeah. are yes. definitely used in the show, maybe used in the show. Like if I'm yeah. speculative, can I just sign up for one of these? Even if I'm like, I don't yes. think I want you doing this. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. If you have no interest in being on the show, it's cool. And just to yeah. like have a conversation about it. And, it, you know, this this is normalizing the conversation about it. This is making women feel and menstruators not feel alone because mm -hmm. it is this thing that you know, is <laughs> happens monthly and still we don't talk mm -hmm. about it or there's like a deep, deep sense of uncomfortability with it. Not for me. I don't know. That's why you're hosting the show, Jessica. I was going to say I'm hosting because because Sarah has a bleeding disorder and she's mm -hmm. a sex therapist, mm -hmm. which makes sense. But I, it's because, fun fact, the blood that flows through my veins is menstrual blood. How do you know this? I intuited it. Oh, gotcha. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'm yeah. caught up now. Yeah. I w that makes tons of sense. Right. Uh, I also, I agree. That my, that the blood that flows through my veins is menstrual blood? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, I agree. Thank you. Based on, you know, where I'm sitting over here. How's your, yeah, your intuition also? My intuition is very strong for this. Yeah. Amy? I feel great about it. Okay, cool. It like sits, <laughs> it sits right. I'm going to use that in press releases for okay, flow okay. now. So I hope that's okay. Great. Yeah, no, we can definitely print that. Consider this the approval. I have uh, only one other question that is on my little hit list here that I want to make sure to get to. So I'm going to ask it now, um, which is about this idea of health equity, which mm. we, we speak about um, quite a lot. And I think we were speaking about it on Bloodstream and elsewhere in our work at Believe Limited well before the term health equity was as widely adopted and understood as it is now. But just simply the idea that each person ought to get the health care that he or she needs and deserves. Um, there's an element of health equity in what we're discussing today. Dismissal, forced endurance. These are the, the, the need for equity here is quite clear. Uh, and we see that in other areas of the bleeding disorders community. But I'm curious from the experience on flow, and again, with all of the people that you've had, the various guests you've had come through, is there anything as it relates to the concept of health equity that for you has either evolved or crystallized or, or come about anew because of the work you're doing on flow and speaking to all these menstruators? I will say, so, okay. Health equity is something that we're trying to achieve over time. It's not the place we've started. That seems to be something that's repeated by the activists we have on the show. Jack Teeter was incredible from Planned Parenthood, regional director of government affairs, talked about organizing, always be organizing. Not ABC's, the Alec Baldwin thing, would always be closing. What's that from? Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Thank you so much, theater degree. Mm -hmm. Shout out David Mamet. <laughs> But always be organizing. The idea that the only way we're going to get to health equity is by actively building it. Mm. And it's not where we started. It's where we're going. And it's step by step. It's like climbing Everest, step mm. by step by step. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'm glad Jack raised that on the show and that you called it back just now. It's also something I think about broadly when it comes to bleeding disorders because we have benefited from uh, having a really powerful advocacy contingency in the bleeding disorders community being a very well organized rare disorder community historically and presently but i think over the last few years and my expectation is we'll continue to see this there's going to be some real tests to how you keep that community together and keep that activism energy going forward the point you just made about health equity is not a destination it's the starting place it's where we're attempting to get to it's where the journey is supposed to be taking us mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like advocacy in bleeding disorders is considered something that's on maintenance mode. Mm. Like we've already done the hard work. We're mm. already over the hardest of times. Mm -hmm. And now we just need to make mm. sure to like keep checking this box, show mm -hmm. up to the one thing a year, like make sure I get my clinic mm -hmm. visit in. And it doesn't have the same level of urgency attached to it mm. that I believe is necessary for long-term progress mm -hmm. toward an ambitious goal, which 
health equity is, which health equity across the bleeding disorders community is. It is mm -hmm. not something that will be achieved in maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. And that characterization may not be totally fair, mm -hmm. but that's just something that based on my experience mm -hmm. I've seen and I've spoken about here on, in various ways before, Amy, and it does concern me. And some of the issues aren't going to concern you personally. Right. As we like, you know, climb that ladder towards health equity, there are some things that we can all fight for as a community that are not going to affect you personally. Sure. And then, you know, I have a daughter two and a half years ago, and there are certain things that used to not affect me personally. Now they do. And if she were to have a child in 15, 25, 30 years, there may be new things that affect me that didn't. Yeah. Or if she, if I learned something about her, oh, now this is something I care about that I used to not care about. It, it really, it, it, it's like the egocentric part of it. It doesn't. It, a community isn't about you. Yeah. You know, we're quoting a lot of people. Let's quote some more people, right? Yeah. JFK had that thing about it's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And, you know, that's a good politician-y line. But also, that's true. And that's true of any community. It's not about what can this do for me? What can you do for it? And then when your time of need comes, Amy, you spoke about this mm -hmm. toward the beginning of this episode when we were chatting about mm -hmm. the walks and mm -hmm. stuff. When you have a need... There is nothing better than a community. Mm -hmm. So when you have a need, the community will be there. But right. if you're starting places, what do I get out of this? Or right, well, right, what is right, this right. newsletter and the issues of today? They right. don't impact me. What do I care anymore? Well, right. just you wait, because there will be a moment in time where something affects you. And if you've stopped investing in this thing that's bigger than you, it's not going to be there to support you when you need it. Yeah. So how to stay urgent without mm. staying stressed. Right. How to stay urgent. Without and connected, being like where are your pieces to like to help, you know, because we all can't do it alone. And, you know, that's why... Um, our organizations are so important mm. to kind of swing things back. I, I guess I kind of wondered as we like wind down a little bit, um, you've mentioned a lot of our past episodes here, just like guests and things like that. But I wonder if you have one that you're really proud of mm. um, and yeah, and just share a little bit. So if people are interested and maybe haven't checked out Flow, maybe they could uh, start with a Jessica Lauren yeah. Richmond fave. Oh my gosh, I don't. It's gonna sound like because it's just recentivity, but June's episode was amazing because it was the result of three separate conversations about period pain, and then a fourth one of Sarah and I talking about these stories and what was interdisciplinarily interesting about them. Mm. Yeah. So that is my favorite. I hope we do more like it. I will also say coming up, I'm excited. We have rep Jamie Church is in the house. <laughs> she's a house representative and she's in the house of flow for July's episode. And then in August, we're talking to the sex evangelicals. Sure. Which, about what? the sex ed the church didn't want you to have, which I yes. think is great. Ooh. And they're all, I, I'm kind of psyched about them because they really want to talk like relationally. Like how do we talk about this relationally? Mm, mm. Which we, we've, we've, like every episode kind of has a flavor to that, but they they very much want to. Anyway, the, the next few episodes of Flow are lit. <laughs> yeah. So if you're not already, subscribe now. You'll get that most recent one that Jessica was just talking about in your podcast player. And then you'll get the two coming up later this summer, populating as soon as they go live. Jessica Lauren Richmond and her co-host Sarah Watson every month on Flow. Stories of extreme menstruation and those who experience it. Um, Jessica, any par final words, anything you want to leave the audience with before we sign off? If you're interested, of course, again, in the program notes, click the link. You can chat with Jess and Sarah, maybe for the pod or off, off mic if you'd prefer. But anything else, Jess, you'd like to leave people with before we go? How's your flow? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm menstruating today. Thank oh you so much god, for asking. Yes, I am. For the occasion of coming on today, I decided okay. to menstruate. Oh my gosh, that's, it feels right. It feels great. Oh my gosh, it's so fun being able to ask you that question. <laughs> I learned you can control when you start your menstruation. That's what I just learned. Oh! Yes, I can. Only if you have menstrual blood flowing, flowing through, through your, your veins. veins. Like me. Jessica Lauren Richmond, the one and only. Thank you so much for coming on Bloodstream today. Listeners, stick around. We are next going to go over to James Maple and our music and expression segment, this time featuring Max Feinstein. Mm. Stick around. Jessica, you're released. Oh my gosh, I love James Maple. Back to the Flow House. Oh, I want to see his James Maple segment, though. You can listen to it okay. on the Bloodstream podcast. Oh, great. My favorite show. Hey friends, James Maple here again with another Bloodstream segment. Now, to our eagle-eyed or rather eagle-eared listeners out there, you may recognize today's music spotlight. We're going to take a deep dive into the music world with Heem A. Blood Brother, national and state-level music programmer, singer, songwriter, and friend to the show, 
Max Feinstein. Now, Max and I met several months ago at a hemophilia event, and we hit it off immediately. I knew from our first conversation that Max's love for all types of music was undeniable. Without hesitation, I knew after speaking with him, the theme of today's segment would be honesty. Moreover, honesty and the full spectrum, having it in all of its glory and facing that honesty when you need to do it most. Only then can we grow, evolve, transcend to a better, higher self. And listening to Borderlines, our lead in track, that message was made clear, but I'll leave it up to Max to explain it to you further. So Borderlines is about rage and depression and how they can really distort reality. It deals in a lifelong resentment that I've carried around about how I will be on an expensive and rare medication for the entirety of my life. And even when I do everything right, that medication can still fail me. It's ultimately about acknowledging, owning, and trying to transcend those feelings. You know, although sometimes the truth can be ugly, there is still beauty in that truth. Painting a picture through rose-colored glasses may give you temporary relief, but does it really solve the problem at its root? Does it help convey your message in its entirety? Not being afraid to go there could actually help you get there. We often take this subject matter and try to put it into a more classically uplifting perspective. And these are challenging songs, both musically and conceptually. They deal in dark matters and they really don't let up once they get going. They're very intense. So I wanted to make sure that I was doing right by what you were after and by my art. Now, as I mentioned previously, Max bears it all. He bears a soul. His vulnerability, his openness in his music is refreshing and honestly, incredibly relatable. The honesty regarding his past, specifically his childhood challenges with hemophilia, still affect him to this very day. Songs like Stop the Madness, my personal favorite song, and the lead out song to the segment, speak directly to this truth, to his truth, and he tells it only how he can. So Stop the Madness is a lot like Borderlines. They're both off of a record that was designed to help me unpack my unresolved feelings around hemophilia, and it deals a lot in feelings of self-loathing and guilt that revolve around the uncontrolled emotionality I had as a kid and beyond when it came to aspects of treatment. There were a lot of times in which I couldn't just be brave and take a needle, and those instances really haunt me, and it's my job to confront that. As always, we'll be sure to include all of Max's links to his music in the show notes below, and as you listen to Stop the Madness, the lead out to this segment, remember to be well, be honest, and as always, peace. Thank you to Max Feinstein, of course, James Maple, and before that, Jessica Lauren Richmond for contributing to today's episode of the Bloodstream Podcast, an episode that would not be possible, of course, without our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Thank you, Takeda. Visit bleedingdisorders.com for more. Amy Board, mm -hmm. Bloodstream Podcast. It will be back next on July the 14th, which puts us officially in the second half of 2023. Wowzers. What can listeners expect to hear on the next episode? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. We didn't plan this, but it seems like we're doing a, a bit a bit of a thing. <laughs> we had Dr. Mike from Cheat Codes, we did. Bloodstream Media Network podcast. Yep. We had uh, Jessica Lauren Richman on today from the Flow podcast, a Bloodstream Media Network podcast. And Correct. next episode, no. you're going to get one, maybe two what? superstars of another Bloodstream Media Network podcast. Get out of here. Wow. One, maybe Nothing two guests. Nothing other than that. Nothing other than that. That is extraordinary, Amy Board. Well, thank you as always. Uh, listeners, once again, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. If you've got a shout out about something, we may shout it out. Mm -hmm. If you want to propose topics or inquire about any of the many casting opportunities that Bloodstream Media and Believe Limited have in store, Again, email us bloodstream mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You cannot, we're not taking it out. We can also find Amy Board or myself on social media. 
You know the places. You know how social media works. Good luck to you. And with all of that, <laughs> that is all for this episode. I'm your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your other host and Denver Nuggets fan, Amy Board. And until next time, enjoy your parade and take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.